So, you want to weld, but first you kind of need a welder. But before we even talk about welders, let's talk about gas and modes of transfer. Welcome to Welding with Joe. This is my first official video in this series. I'm going to try to keep these videos between 5 and 10 minutes roughly because that's where you guys learn the most and that's before you start to lose attention. So with that, let's get right to it. So first let's tackle the easy one, TIG. Tungsten Inert Gas, or GTAW, Gas Tungsten Arc Welding. I'm going to call it TIG. Which gas do you use? There's one gas to rule them all, 100% argon. This will allow you to weld stainless, aluminum, mild steel, pretty much all the stuff that you'd want to TIG weld. Let's talk a little bit about polarity, DC versus AC. DC, or direct current, is when the polarity goes in one direction. DC positive means the current flows into your welding electrode. DC negative means it flows into your workpiece. AC or alternating current means it oscillates between DC minus and DC plus. Then there's pulsing. Don't confuse this with polarity. This allows you to move back and forth between different amperages. Pulsing can be used with any polarity. TIG is used with DC negative or AC and MIG is used with DC positive. There are circumstances when you could weld MIG with DC negative, but we're not really going to get into that. For TIG, we'll use AC on all aluminum and DC negative for all steel. The AC breaks up that oxidation layer on top of the aluminum and lets us get down below to the actual aluminum underneath. When adding pulsing, it helps control the heat input. So make sure when you're looking for a TIG welder to get one with AC if you're going to be welding aluminum. You also need high frequency start, but we'll get to that in my video about weld machine selection. And now, some of my favorite info to pass along. Modes of transfer for MIG. MIG, metal inert gas, or GMA, gas metal arc welding. I'm going to call it MIG because it's short and it's one less syllable than GMA. What are modes of transfer? Globular, short circuit, spray, and pulse. Globular is another one of those niche things, kind of like MIGging and DC negative. The only application I know of for both of those is in automotive exhaust manufacturing, aka Tenneco Walker, just down the road from me with their huge plant. They weld on super thin sheet metal, making up exhaust and exhaust tubing, but they still need to fill massive gaps with weld. The polarity keeps that thin metal cool instead of melting and blowing away. And the welding wire is deposited on the workpiece exactly how it sounds, globularly. It melts and it falls down in giant balls. And the end result is a high transfer rate or a high deposition rate, but a really crappy looking weld. Don't worry about globular transfer. This is probably the last time you'll ever hear about it. Short circuit is also a cold transfer mode. One of the main reasons I wanted to create this video. The wire hits the workpiece, it short circuits. The metal actually, the wire heats up until it melts and then it falls into the puddle. So you have X length of wire sticking out that falls in. This is what the majority of hobbyist welders use. When you see the dimes that people are laying down on social media, this is what they're using. Now this is one of my Biggest pet peeves. There are no pre-qualified welding procedures for short circuit. This is because it varies so much. It's inconsistent and it's typically cold. Those dimes you see probably don't have any penetration. And while they may look cool, they're probably crappy welds. We need to focus on the soundness of our welding procedures from the face to the root, not how cool they look on the surface. So what's a pre-qualified welding procedure? It's something that's been tested so many times, over and over and over, that AWS puts out recipes for you to copy so you can make good welds that you can feel assured will have complete penetration. They don't have the confidence to pre-qualify anything with short circuit transfer, so that right there should scare you away from using it. It also creates a ton of spatter and it can only be used on thinner material. Spray transfer is the way to go. Instead of sticking wire into the weld puddle and waiting for it to heat up and melt and fall in, you're basically spraying little tiny BBs of weld into the puddle 
consistently. The deposition rate is far greater. The heat input is higher. The spatter is extremely low compared to globular or short circuit transfer. And in my opinion, it's just easier for operators to do. But there are voltage and shielding gas requirements to get into spray transfer. So you can be limited by your machine whether or not you'll be able to spray. You have to have a minimum of 24 volts and a minimum of 80% argon. And since you need 80% argon, C25 is out. Now, I've personally watched my welder's machines while they're welding in spray, and I've seen less than 24 volts. So I know it's possible, but that's kind of controversial. Just shoot for 24 as a minimum threshold because that's where you'll need to be and you'll typically be welding a lot higher. Now I will tell you there's a very audible difference between short circuit and spray. Short circuit sounds like bacon frying, spray sounds like hissing. And then you get into pulsed and it's just weird. You can make music out of it, you can YouTube it, there's pulse MIG welding songs, it's weird. So what are the downsides to spray? Because I've been talking it up so much. Well, it is pretty fluid, so it's really only used in horizontal and flat welding, not out of position like vertical or overhead. You can't use it on super thin stuff. It's mainly used for eighth inch and up. And then we have pulsed or pulse spray. So this is spray, but the machine oscillates to a low background amperage giving it a moment to cool off. This mode of transfer is selected within your machine, not just using the correct gas and voltage. It's actually a software and hardware generated thing. The humongous benefits here are lower heat input while maintaining that high deposition rate, almost non-existent spatter. You can weld out of position, which is pretty big, and you can weld thick and thin material. The only downside to get the, one of these pulsed MIG welders is the cost. They're all going to be above $3,000. Now let's talk about gas. Most people don't know enough about MIG welding gas to think much into it, so they just do what every Tom, Dick, and Harry are doing and use C25. Now there are several different combinations of MIG shielding gases, but I only have personal experience with a few, and that's what we're going to talk about. These would be 100% pure CO2, C10, and C25. Then you'll get into exotic blends like moon gas, blends containing oxygen and helium. And I don't MIG stainless, so I haven't had to mess with any of those. I only MIG mild and high alloy steel, so that's what we'll talk about here. It's very important you do your homework to select the proper shielding gas for your metal you'll be welding. If you're MIGing aluminum or stainless, you'll need to consult with an expert on those. So what is C10? The number is the percent of CO2 in the mixture, with the remainder being argon. So C10 is 90% argon, 10% CO2. 100% CO2, or pure CO2, is the cheapest. It runs hot, you'll get the deepest penetration, you'll also get a boatload of spatter. In manufacturing, the cost to remove said spatter is a serious consideration when determining production costs. They have to hire people full time to remove this stuff. I wouldn't touch pure CO2 with a 10 foot pole and neither should you. You can only use this with short circuit transfer. C25 is what every Tom, Dick and Harry are using because that other guy said he uses it and it's good. And this is another reason I wanted to create this video. C25 is cheaper, yeah, but it produces a ton of spatter still and you can't spray with it. So to me, it's useless and I want to touch it with a 20 foot pole. C10 is where it's at. And this is possibly one of my favorite things to share with people when trying to help them improve their welding. With 90% argon, you can spray. The spatter is minimal, so even if you can only short circuit because you have voltage limitations, it's still the best gas to use. The cost of the gas is lower than your exotic blends with the oxygen and the helium, so it's the most economical option if you want to get into spray. This is what the manufacturing industry uses, and it's what the hobbyist world should all be using too, but as long as we have uneducated people, they're just going to keep using that C25 or that poor man's CO2. So spread the word. Let's get the hobbyists using C10. So what should we take away from this video? Think about the types of metal you'll be welding, and think about the thicknesses. And when you go to buy your gas, get 100% argon for TIG and get C10 for MIG. 
Thanks, guys. We'll see you in our next video.